Hi guys, in this video we'll be looking at a mock test from Asheville Driving Test Centre. So, this video starts coming out the driveway for the test centre. When you're coming down here, my advice is always keep the car nice and straight all the way to the giveaway line so you can see around those signs that are on the right and so you don't lean across these lines. They're very faded but there are markings there telling you to keep nice and straight. So all the way up to the end, nice and straight so you can see around those signs and then of course You've got a good view up and down the road to decide whether you can go or not. As we come out, the pupil builds his speed really nicely. It is a 30 mile an hour zone, but we've got quite a few driveways either side. So, so 25 is absolutely fine. And then, of course, we've got this set of lights ahead for the railway crossing. If these light up, you want to make sure you stop at the stop line, treat it like a traffic light. Um, once you get to the point of no return, you're going to cross it. Just make sure you can get the whole way across. Never, ever, ever stop in those or enter them without a clear exit. At the mini roundabout here will be turning left so you can see the filter lane there. There's no oncoming cars from the right hand side so we've got a clear path and the pupil keeps it rolling through that turn absolutely spot on. Notice the national speed limit sign there so now we can pick that speed up. It is a 60 mile an hour limit on a road like this however with all the driveways, the bollards, the filter lanes and such I wouldn't advise doing 60 40 45 might be quite comfortable down here till the road opens out a little bit more just up ahead we've got a set of traffic lights and you'll see the markings as we approach telling us what lanes to use two lanes to go straight and we're going to filter off into the right hand side here for our right turn you notice the extra set of lights for us that isolates us when we turn right so when we get our green light here It'll be a green arrow which allows us to cross that junction without having to worry about the oncoming cars. So our lights will be green while the oncoming traffic's red. You'll see the cars on the other side do the same. Their cars that are turning right can go across. And these roads, uh, these lanes that will be heading across us that normally you'd give way to, that filter light tells you they'll be on red. As we enter the new road, notice the lanes merging. See the car on the right there. It's really important to look at your mirrors when you join roads like this. Keep an eye on who's behind you and watch out for if they're going to overtake like this guy did. If they do, just ease off, let them go. If, of course, they're staying behind you, get your speed up, get it moving. You've got a nice clear road ahead. It's a 60 mile an hour limit, so build that speed up. The examiners want to see good, confident progress on roads like this. And again, as we come to the lights, just be mindful they might change. Keep an eye on that right mirror here because of the extra lane, which merges again after the lights. Just like before, we're looking for cars that may be overtaking that we might need to ease off and let pass, um, or ones that are holding back to merge behind you. So you've got to keep on those mirrors to keep yourself up to date on what's going on all the time. Up on the left, you'll notice a small section of railings. These are normally in place where there's a footpath or an alleyway. These railings are normally in place to stop pedestrian cyclists just coming out the alley and straight into the road. So they're a good indication that there may be pedestrians or cyclists around, so watch out for those. And of course, the footpath there, if you do see any cyclists or pedestrians along here, just keep an eye on them. Make sure they're not too close to the edge of the road as you go by. And if they are, just move out a little bit, give them a bit more room. Now along this road the pupil's been keeping a really good following distance from the car ahead and as we reach the next junction you can see how that pays off. We can keep the braking nice and smooth, nice and relaxed. We don't have to react to the car in front because we can see what's going on. And the pupil does that really nicely just bringing the car down ever so gently to join that queue as we come up to those lights there. 
So really, really good example there of keeping a good following distance. Don't feel that you've got to chase the car in front because additional to getting too close and then having to react to them potentially, you also can get dragged along with their speed. And if they are traveling at a higher speed than the limit, then you could end up just keeping pace with them and accidentally creeping over that speed in it too. So keep a really good following distance and keep an eye on your own speed when you're traveling along roads like this. It also, like I said, gives you plenty of stopping time and plenty of visibility when we come up to junctions like this. Notice the signs as we cross that we had a 40 and then back to national speed limit. So if you're turning left or right, it'd be 40 because we're going straight ahead back into national speed limit. And again, the pupil's keeping a really good following distance on the cars in front. Plenty of time to respond if they slow down and plenty of view around that lorry up ahead too if we're getting closer to big vehicles it's going to obstruct a big chunk of our view and that just makes things more challenging than we want them to be we want to keep things really simple and really easy for ourselves so keeping a good view of the road ahead is going to help you plan and make things smoother as you come up to different um, changes up ahead Notice the signs up ahead now. We're coming up to a junction, a roundabout, where we'll be turning left first exit. So the pupil comes in really nicely. He's started bringing that speed down. He's got his mirrors covered, the left signal on. Notice the speed change to 40. The crossing's clear so we can keep moving. Notice the uh, gray Ford Ranger on the right there. The pupil thinks they're going to lean around and just jabs the brakes a little bit there. Um, it isn't to the point that I think he created a real significant risk but it was noticeable enough to be recorded as a driver fault there. So be really careful when you're joining roundabouts that you don't misjudge what people are doing. Come in a little bit slower, and it means you don't have to jab the brakes if someone is coming around. Um, but of course, keep an eye on the indicators, keep an eye on their front wheels, because that'll tell you where that vehicle's going. And if you've got a gap, keep it moving. What we want to avoid is sharp braking, even if it's just a brief tap on the brakes. It could be enough for the car behind to get too close and panic react and that of course can cause a knock-on effect behind them and then of course because you've had an impact on the traffic behind it could escalate to a serious or dangerous fault on your test in this circumstance it was a very brief tap on the brake and it was straight off into the roundabout after that once he realized the jeep was turning off and it didn't affect the car behind so it's just going to be a driver fault on that occasion Another roundabout, and just like the last one, we're going straight ahead. So the pupil's approaching in that left-hand lane. You can see the markings tell us that both lanes go straight. So as we go across, we're going to keep nice and wide in that first lane. The pupil does a really good job of that. My advice is cover the right mirror here for other cars that might be coming off with you. See those arrows telling them to merge in as well. So if someone is coming off with you, they may be trying to get around you and that could cause you a problem. So you need to know who's coming with you. Those mirrors are absolute lifesavers in situations like that. And the examiners are going to be expecting you to be all over those mirrors in situations like that too. So lots and lots of mirror use where's the potential for someone to go around you. Up ahead, we've got a traffic light junction where the pupil's going to be turning left. There is a road just before this, and the pupil puts his signal on, then realizes this road's here and cancels that signal. Because it didn't cause any effect to anyone else, but it was notable, I'm going to put a driver fault for that. If he left the signal on, that could potentially be a serious fault. And if somebody come out that junction and misread the signal and pulled out on him, that, of course, would be a dangerous fault. So we want to be really, really careful about signal time and watch out for those side roads before you get to your turn. Make sure you're not misleading people as you approach. And if you do make a mistake, correct it like this pupil did. He put the signal on, spotted that side road, and cancelled it straight away. That's why it's only going to go down as a driver fault on this occasion. As we come into the dual carriageway here, you can see we've got two lanes taking us ahead. And the pupil's positioned really nicely on the left. This is where we should be where there's more than one lane. If you're in the right-hand lane, it should be for overtaking or turning right, or if the left lane doesn't go where you're, you're intending on going, then the right lane would be appropriate, of course. But your normal position, if you can use it, is the left-hand lane. 
So make sure you stick into that position when you're driving down roads like this. Additionally, we want to be making sure we're covering that right hand mirror as we go along roads like this. Like I said earlier, we can have cars coming up behind us to overtake. They may pass you and then try to move back in. So we want to know what's coming up behind us and just be prepared for them as they come by. And then if we need to make any adjustments to help them out, such as helping them move in before they turn left, then that's absolutely fine. We can plan for that if we know they're there. But if we don't know they're there, if we're not using those mirrors, we can't do anything about them. And that puts us in a more risky situation. So lots and lots of mirror use as you're going along roads like this, and it'll just help you keep up to date on who's around you and what they're planning to do. Notice the sign there saying we're on a two-way traffic road and the lane's merging in. So again, lots of mirror use as we come down this road. We want to know who's potentially going to try and get around us. And we want to know as we slow down, like here with the cars in front braking, if we're going to have an impact on those vehicles behind and if we need to do anything about that, if they're going to chance it to get around us, for example. As we're coming down the hill here, you'll notice the pupil gets right up to the 30 mile an hour mark and then it eases back down again. Now, that's absolutely fine. We're going downhill. The car is going to pick up speed more quickly, so we want to be careful of that. So my advice going downhill is just keep those brakes covered and let the car use its own momentum and wait to carry on down the hill if you safely can. Whenever we come up to roadworks as well, you can see the pupil here keeping a really good space behind this Range Rover. And just be mindful of these signs here because we can't actually see those traffic lights, but the warning sign tells us that our lights and that the works are on the right hand side of the road. So if we were to try and go around this Range Rover, that'd be a pretty poor decision at this point. And you see also the red sign saying wait here. It says three way control. So we've got three sets of lights, meaning we could be here for a short while. So you just got to sit patiently and just wait for those lights to run their cycle. When the car in front moves, we'll see the lights and then we can make a choice whether it's safe to go or not. Just keep in mind, sometimes these temporary lights do freeze and you'll see people go through on red. Don't take it for granted if they go through that those lights may have failed. You've got to make a sound judgment on what you can see. So officially, if that light is red, even if it's faulty, you must wait. And if you choose to go through, then anything that comes of that is entirely your liability. Another downhill stretch here, and as I mentioned earlier, we want to be careful about the speed of the car as we go downhill. Sometimes it's really easy for it to pick up the pace and end up creeping over the limit. So very, very mindful of that. I'm going to get my pupil to pull up behind the car on the left here. This is an angle start, so you'll be asked to pull up just behind a parked vehicle about a car length away. Once you've pulled up, you'll be expected to pull out around that vehicle safely. So the examiners want to see good steering control, a nice low speed to get the front of the car around it. And of course, lots of observations. We've got to check our right shoulder as we're coming out. We've got to look for oncoming cars as well, because the front of our car may swing wide as we go around here, even on a road like this. Just be careful of how wide you're going around that parked car. Now, I find that sometimes people stare at the parked car and that makes them oversteer and lean away from it or understeer and get too close. So put your focus on where you want to go. Don't look at the obstruction itself. Don't fixate on it. So keep your mind on where you want to go. Keep your eyes moving and keep the car slow and steady as you move out before you pick up your speed after getting the car straightened up. Uh, these traffic lights we're going to be going straight ahead and the pupil has chosen the right hand lane now that in itself is not an issue we should be in the left hand line ideally notice those keep clear markings here the pupil stopped inside that box now if that causes a problem that will be a serious fault on your test now because the pupil's only got his front wheels in and there's enough room in front of him that vehicles could get around him if they wanted to still i'm only going to record a driver fault Additionally, with the lane discipline here, the choice to use the right-hand lane, I'm not going to fault that because as he progresses in this lane, he's using his left mirror really effectively before bringing the car in to close that gap. There's no issue caused by doing that, and he corrects it in good time. 
Coming down the hill here, just notice the speed crept up to 33, so that's got to be a driver fault for use of speed. Pupil catches it quite quickly and slows down again. Like I said earlier, if you're going downhill, just be really mindful of how quickly the car can pick up. And ideally, we want to be preventing the car from picking up over that speed limit. So you want to be on those brakes a little bit earlier when you see the hill come in. Notice ahead, we've got two lanes as we come up to the next junction. The pupils correctly chose the left-hand lane for this one. So this is the ideal position again. We don't want to be in the right-hand lane unless we need to be. So we're not overtaking, we're not turning right. Stick to that left-hand lane. And again, a good space behind this Mini. So it's not getting too close and too uncomfortable with it. We're giving enough room that if anything happens, there's that sort of cushion of space to keep us away from the Mini. So if the Mini let's say breaks down, we can get round it. If you're on a hill, the Mini's less likely to roll back into you. And of course, if you get shunted, the unlikely event that someone goes into the back of you, you're less likely to get pushed into that Mini. So just giving yourself plenty of room there. Notice the markers have changed to left only here. Now the pupil's got wise to his signal timing here. We've got a left turn and then the traffic light where we'll be turning. So no signals at this point. And as we pass this junction on the left, then he puts his signal on. Putting a signal on before could cause that pedestrian to think we're going to turn and cause him to stop unnecessarily. And again, that could result in a fault on your driving test. So be very mindful again about those signals and when you use them. Again, coming down the road here, we've got two lanes, the pupil sticking left, and that's absolutely spot on. Unless we're overtaking or turning right, remember, we want to be in that left lane. So if you find yourself in the second lane, and you shouldn't be, get on that left mirror, get a signal on, and find a safe place to move in. While we're waiting at these lights here, notice the car on the right with the roll of carpet sticking out the window. Um, as a driver, you're responsible for carrying loads safely and when you've got a roller carpet blocking your entire left view of the car that is not a safe way of carrying it something like that would completely obscure your view of the left side of the car so being in lane two there makes him exceptionally risky if you're coming up near vehicles who are carrying loads like that just give them a wide berth we're going to come into the car park here to do our maneuver very, very tight entry to the car park. So we want to come in really, really slowly. And the pupil does a really nice job of that, keeping it under five mile an hour as he comes in. We're turning right, and then we're going to pick a parking space to drive forwards into. Now the pupil is going to pick up a fault for this, but he does a really good job. And my view of this is when you're picking a space, we shouldn't pick a space that is alongside another car if possible. So the three spaces on the right there, I'd have went for the middle one right behind that red car. However, the pupil goes for the one next to the Fiat. That Fiat creates less room for him to swing round, and as a result, he needs to back up and correct the maneuver. Now, if you find yourself correcting a maneuver, like this pupil does, nice and slow, lots of looking around, just a little shuffle over, and he's inside the lines completely then. I've sped that up because he took a little bit of time doing it. He was very, very slow doing it, which is good in some respects. But of course, we don't want to be ridiculously slow because he didn't cause an issue with how he was doing the maneuver. I can't fault him on that part. But of course, the little shuffle, the correction, because he didn't bring it in first go, is going to be recorded as a driver fault. We're reversing steering left to get out of this space. And steering left brings the back of the car to the left. So the front then, of course, points to the right, which means we're facing the exit. Now, anytime we go through car parks, of course, take your time, look around for cars that are moving about, coming in and out of spaces, or people making the way across between parked cars to get to their vehicle or to get to wherever they're going. So lots and lots of looking around and take your time. Keep it tight to the left too, because it's a two-way car park. And on the exit, you'll see we've got a give way, no right turns. If they've got signs like this, the examiners will not say a word. They'll expect you to see that information and just turn left. If you come out and ask them which way, you're probably going to get marked for not looking at those signs. As we come out, you can see the bus lane going the other way. So this is what's known as a contraflow. It's technically a one-way street, but the bus lanes go in the opposite way on it. Um, you can get that with cycle lanes too. But of course, being a car, it counts as a one-way street as far as we're concerned. 
Now this road does get a little bit tight at points, so you can see the pupil keeping his speed nice and low, and as vehicles come towards him, he's dipping in towards the left to give them a little bit more room. Particularly here, going into that space on the left creates more room for the bus. I like my mirrors attached to the car, so we don't want to be getting too close to that bus and losing those mirrors. If you do that on your test, you will get failed, guarantee it. Again, coming around here, two lanes, and you can see the pupil takes up the left-hand position, which is absolutely spot on again, before coming to a gentle stop at those red lights. When these lights change, the car that's next to us hesitates to go. Now, I'm not sure why, whether they were on the phone or distracted, but that causes my pupil to doubt whether he can go. So there's a little bit of delay in moving off. Because he didn't cause too much of an issue, it's only going to go down as a driver fault in response to those lights. I'm not going to give him anything more than that. If he did wait for longer, or it caused the car behind to react by sounding the horn, for example, then that would go down as a serious fault for not responding to those lights. So be very, very careful of other drivers not doing what they should, and that causing you to be misled into making a mistake. Pay attention to what you're doing and what you should be doing in response to those lights. If you get too distracted by the car next to you, of course, like this pupil, you're going to hesitate. Now that car next to you could be looking for a filter light that maybe you haven't registered as you're coming up to that junction. And then of course you're going to be sitting there at green light while they're sat at their own red light. So yeah, just keep your mind focused on you. Don't get too distracted by other people's mistakes. Up ahead, we've got a pedestrian crossing. You'll notice some people on the left, and it changes just as my pupil's approaching. My view on that one is that the pupil was close enough to commit and that they committed fluently as well. So there was no issue caused in the way they responded to those lights. So I'm not going to record any fault for that one. If you hesitate at those lights, as soon as you come off the power, that indicates you're going to stop. So if you slow down and then go, that's going to cause an issue. It's going to mean you're potentially going to mislead those pedestrians into walking out. And of course, that's going to be a dangerous fault straight away. So whenever you come up to traffic lights, you've got to be very certain of what you're going to do. We either commit wholeheartedly or we go for the stop fully. It can't be a case of, um, because as soon as you say, um, you don't know what you've done, you've delayed your decision. And that, of course, is going to cause you problems. Be very decisive. Pick a point of no return. And when those lights change, if you've already reached that point of no return, get on with it. Uh, this set of lights were turning right. You'll see the pupil lines up really nicely for this. He leans into the right as he passes the curb and stays back from the oncoming car, giving himself time to see what's coming in the other two lanes. He can see it's clear and off he goes. And that's exactly what we want to be doing there. If you hold back too far, you're not going to be able to see around that oncoming car. If you move too far forward, you're going to interfere with whatever is coming up in that second lane. So very, very careful about those. We want to get as far forward as we can without interfering with the other traffic. And of course, leaning into that turn is really essential too. So you point in the car where you want to go. And that also is going to give you the best path across the junction. Note the warning on the left there saying there's a bend up ahead and we had slow written on the road. We've got the black and white arrows too. So we want to come around this bend at a comfortable speed. We've got a few potholes as well. You can see the car bouncing around a bit. Notice how the pupil's keeping around 20 as he comes around that. Absolutely spot on there. We don't want to come pelt him around there at 30 because that's going to make it very difficult to control. And of course, we don't have as much time then to respond to whatever we're driving into. So if there's parked cars or if there's oncoming vehicles overtaking a parked car. Asking my pupil to pull up on the left here. Notice the driveway on the left. He's got his front wheels over that. Whenever you pull over, you want to make sure you're clear of every driveway you can. Stop by the higher curbs between them. Um, so you're not obstructing anyone from getting in there out of their properties. If you do stop over a driveway, normally it'll just be a driver fault. So that's what I'm going to record on that occasion.
Up ahead, we've got a set of traffic lights where we'll be turning left. As we approach this rear driveway on the left, um, just be mindful about vehicles coming in and out of there. And if you do end up queuing up at these lights, make sure you keep that driveway clear. So if anyone's turning into your road and wants to get into that driveway, you're not going to cause a queue back into the junction by blocking them. As we do sit at the traffic lights, use that time to reset, take a couple of breaths and keep your eyes moving as well, of course. Keep looking around for anything that's going on around you, cyclists coming up behind you, for example, or motorbikes that might be filtering up to get to the front of the queue. And then when you go, you've already got an idea of what's going on around you so you can make safer progress. If you just react to the lights, check your mirrors go, you've then got to process everything in the last minute. So use that time to just keep your eyes moving and get as much information about what's going to happen as you possibly can. So when you move away, you're just better informed and do it more effectively and safely. Up ahead, we've got a couple of mini roundabouts and we're going to go straight ahead at both of them. So again, as you come up to roundabout, it's the traffic from the right that you'd give way to. We can see already there's no cars coming. We've got to make sure we're slow enough that the left can see us too. So we don't just want to come flying through there at full speed. We've got to make sure we give them other vehicles time to respond to us as we come down to the junction. I'm going to get my pupil to pull up on the left here. Now I've done this because there's a van behind. I want to see how the pupil responds to that. And he does beautifully. He's on the mirror, spots the van, puts his signal in good time and allows the van plenty of time to react. The examiners may do that on your test with cars behind you just to see that you can do it safely. And then, of course, when you move off, don't forget that right shoulder check. And if there's anyone around, put a signal on. If there's vehicles coming up behind you, just give them time to pass before you pull out. Don't pull out in front of them and cause them to slow down. Another mini roundabout, of course, no traffic on the right, so people keep moving through there really nicely. And again, the pace is good, so cars from the left would be able to see us and stop before we cross that junction. Up ahead, we have another roundabout, and on this one, we'll be going left. So this is, these are the, probably the most tricky ones for people because... You want to look to the right for the traffic coming, but you've also got to look to the left so you can get the steering lined up and keep your position as you make the turn. Most of your attention should be to the left. Little glances to the right. You can already see nothing's coming, so we can make a good, confident decision to keep moving, and that's what we should be doing. Pupil does a really good job of that. His observations are spot on. The same at this roundabout. We've got two lanes going straight ahead, so he takes up the left lane. Nothing coming on the right, so we can focus on his path ahead and just follow that left-hand lane around to his exit. As I said earlier, with these kind of roundabouts, the pupil's covering his right mirror as he left the roundabout, just checking out if anyone was coming around him and whether he needed to do anything about that. If we don't know what's there, then we can't plan for it, so keep an eye on those mirrors where there's space for other vehicles to be coming up behind you. Again, a nice stopping space behind this car is close enough that he's not going to invite people into that gap, but far enough that if anything happens, he's got a little bit of space in front to keep himself safe or to get around that car if he needs to. As we go through the lights as well, what I like to see is a quick glance to the left. You can see the car's not moving and the right, the car's not moving there either. So it's just confirming there's nothing coming through, such as, let's say, cyclists who may not be paying attention to the lights or blue light vehicles that might be approaching. So anytime you go through a green light, keep in mind that a green light means you can proceed if it's safe. It doesn't mean go blindly. So do a little check as you're coming through those lights and be prepared to stop if there's anything to stop for such as someone not paying attention or blue light vehicles this is back onto that 60 mile an hour road that we came out on near the start of the mock test and again you can see the pupils only sitting at 30 because of the vehicles in front it's not an appropriate road to do 60 down so definitely don't do 60 down that road 
for the mini roundabout will be turning right and again you can see the cars on the right that's what the pupil is going to be focusing on because they're the ones with priority in terms of the car on the left we want to give a cursory check as we're going into the roundabout just making sure that they are either stopping or that we're not going to cause a problem as they cross our path as well sometimes people will pull out thinking they can chance their way across in front of the learner you'll notice the cyclist on the left coming down quite quick he is on the footpath however it's not a very wide footpath so the pupils are very conscious of that cyclist as we come round. I did hear the cyclist slamming on his brakes as he came down, but he did stay on the path and the pupil did nothing wrong that caused the cyclist to do that. I think the cyclist just reacted to maybe a dip in the pavement that he didn't want to bounce through. Over the railway crossing and then up to the test centre entry where we'll be turning left just behind the blue sign that says Sherwood House and the white sign that says Tech Tube. As you turn into the test centre, keep it very tight to the left hand side we don't want to swing out into the oncoming lane and the pupil does a really nice job of doing that he's especially aware of this pedestrian who does hold back for us which allows him to carry on safely if she didn't hold back be prepared to stop and that brings us to the end of our mock test so what a fantastic result seven faults and a pass as always guys thank you ever so much for watching this i hope it's been useful please let me know if it has Thank you for watching and God bless you.